Where Love Is, There Is God Also, by Leo Tolstoy, from the Free Public Domain. Rendition from the Sophia Project, Philosophy Archives, read by Brad Pocket. Where Love Is, There Is God Also, Leo Tolstoy. There was a cobbler named Martin Avdich who lived in the city. He lived in a cellar in a little room with a single window, but the window looked out onto the street, and through the window it was possible to see people passing by, and although only their feet were visible, Martin recognized the people by their boots. Martin Optich had lived in the same place for a long time, and had many acquaintances. It was a rare pair of boots in the district which had not been in his hands once or twice. He would put half-soles in some, patches on others, some he would sew up, and other times he'd even make new uppers and he would often see his work through the window. There was much work because Avdich worked hard. He used good material, wouldn't take more than necessary, and he kept his word. He would accept the job if he could complete it by the deadline, but if not, he wouldn't even try to deceive anyone. But he would say so straight out. And everyone knew Avdich, and his work did not cease. Avdich had always been a good person, but in his old age he began to think more about his soul and drew nearer to God. When Martin was still living with his master craftsman, his wife died, leaving the little boy three years old. Their other children did not live. All the older ones had died earlier. At first Martin wanted to give his little son to his sister in the village. Then he felt bad and he thought, it would be so sad for my little Kapitoshka to grow up in someone else's family. I will keep him with me. And Avdich left the master and came to live in an apartment with his little son. But God didn't give Avdich good fortune with his children just as the boy had grown up to begin to help his father and to bring him joy. Kapitoshka fell ill. The boy took to his bed, burned with a fever for a week, and then died. And Martin buried his son and fell into despair. His despair was so great that he began to grumble at God. Such weariness came over Martin that more than once he begged God for death and reproached God for the fact that he took not him, an old man, but his beloved only son. Oftich also stopped going to church. And then one day an old fellow countryman from the Trinity Monastery called on Oftich. He had been journeying for eight years already. Avdich got to talking with him and began to complain to him about his sorrow. I don't even want to live anymore, holy man, he said. I only want to die. I ask God only for this. I have been left a hopeless man now. And the little old man said to him, It is not good to speak like this, Martin. It is forbidden for us to judge God's affair. It is not for our reasoning, but God's judgment. God's judgment was for your son to die, and for you to live. Well then, so much the better. And that you despair, this is because you want to live for your own happiness. And what is there to live for? asked Martin. And the little old man said, You must live for God, Martin. He gives you life, and you must live for him. When you begin to live for him, you will not grieve over anything, and everything will appear easy to you. Martin was silent for a while, and then said, But how am I supposed to live for God? And the old man said, Live for God as Christ has shown us. Do you know how to read? Buy the Gospels and read them. There you will learn how to live for God. And everything is explained there. And these words were imprinted in Avdich's heart. And he set out that very day, bought himself a New Testament in large print, and began to read. Avdich meant only to read on holidays, but as he began to read, his soul became so contented that he started reading every day. Sometimes he would be so engrossed in reading that all the kerosene in the lamp would burn out, and still he could not tear himself away from the book. And so Avdich began to read every evening. And the more he read, the more he clearly understood what God wanted from him and how he had to live for God. And his heart became even lighter and lighter. 
It used to be, formerly, that he would lie down to sleep and moan and groan, constantly thinking about Kapitoshka. But now he just repeated over and over, Glory to thee! Glory to thee, Lord! Thy will be done! And from that time, Avdich's whole life changed. It used to be, formerly, that he would drop into the tavern to celebrate the holidays, drink a little tea, and he wouldn't pass up a little vodka. He would drink with a fellow that he knew, and although he was not quite drunk, he would nevertheless leave the tavern, feeling a little tipsy, and saying senseless things. He would shout at, and even slander a person. Now all that had left him, his life became peaceful and joyful. In the morning, he'd sit down to work, put in his time, take the lamp down from the hook, set it on the table, get the book off the shelf, lay it out, and sit to begin to read. And the more that he read, the more he understood, and the brighter and more cheerful his heart became. Once, it was late, and it happened that Martin was absorbed in reading. He was reading in the Gospel of Luke. He was reading the verses from the sixth chapter. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your coat as well. Give to every one who begs from you, and of him who takes away your goods, do not ask them again. And as you wish that men would do to you, do so unto them. He read on to those verses where the Lord says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation upon a rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house, and he could not shake it because it had been well built. But he who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house in the ground without a foundation, against which the stream broke, and it immediately fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Avdich read these words, and his soul was filled with joy. He removed his glasses, laid them on the book, leaned his elbows on the table, and was lost in thought. And he began to apply these words to his own life. And he thought to himself, well, is my house on a rock or on sand? It is good if it's on rock. And it's easy sitting alone like this. It seems that you have done everything as God commanded, but then you lose your focus and sin again. All the same, I'll try. It's already very good. Help me, Lord. So he thought, and he wanted to lie down, but it was a pity to tear himself away from the book. And he began to read the seventh chapter, too. He read about the centurion and about the son of the widow. He read about the reply to John's disciples and came up to the place where the rich Pharisee invited the Lord to be his guest. And he read how the sinful woman anointed his feet and washed them with her tears and how he justified her. And he came to the 44th verse and began to read. And turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, has, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. He read these verses and thought, He did not give him any water for his feet, or any kisses, and he did not anoint his head with oil. And Avdich took off his glasses again, laid them on the book, and became lost in thought once more. The Pharisee was, evidently, just like me. I guess he too only thought about himself, how to get a cup of tea to drink and to be warm and comfortable, but not thinking about his guests, he thought to himself, but had not even the slightest concern for his guest. And who was his guest? The Lord himself. If he came to me, would I really do the same? And Avdich leaned both on his arms on the table and did not notice that he began to nod off. Martin! Something suddenly breathed in his ear. In his ear. Martin started sleepily. Who's there? He turned around and looked at the door. There was no one there. He dozed off again. Suddenly he heard clearly, Martin! Oh, Martin! Look out onto the street tomorrow. I will come. Martin roused himself, rose from his chair, and began to rub his eyes. 
and he himself did not know whether he had heard these words in a dream or while he was awake. He turned off the lamp and lay down to sleep. In the morning, before it was light, Obdich rose, prayed to God, heated the stove, set his cabbage soup and kasha on it, lit the samor, put on his apron, and sat down by the window to work. Obdich sat and worked, but continually thought about the events of the day before, and he thought in two different ways. For a while he would think it was just his imagination, and then he'd think that he really did hear the voice. Why, he thought, such things have happened. Martin sat by the window, not so much working as looking out the window. And when someone passed in unfamiliar boots, he would bend down and peer out the window in order to see not only their feet, but their face too. A caretaker passed by in new felt boots. A water carrier passed, and then an old soldier from Nicholas Rain drew alongside the window wearing old, stitched felt boots and with a shovel in his hands. Obditch recognized him by his boots. The old man was called Stepanich, and he lived with a neighboring merchant out of charity. His job was to assist the caretaker. Stepanich began to clear away the snow from across Obditch's window. Obditch watched him for a while and got back to work. See, I've evidently gone crazy in my old age, Obditch laughed to himself. Stepanich is clearing the snow, and I think Christ is coming to see me. I've completely gone crazy, an old coot. However, having made about a dozen stitches, Obditch was drawn again to look out the window. He looked out the window again and saw Stepanich had leaned on his shovel against the wall and was half warming himself and half resting. The old man was elderly and broken, and apparently didn't even have the strength to shovel the snow. Avdich thought, Perhaps I should offer him some tea. After all, the s'more is about to boil. Avdich stuck the owl in place, put the s'more on the table, poured the tea, and tapped his finger on the window pane. Stepanich turned around and walked up to the window. Avdich beckoned to him and went to open the door. Come in and warm yourself a bit, perhaps, he said. You must be cold, I guess. Christ save you. The fact is, my bones do ache, said Stepanich. Stepanich came in, shook off the snow, and began to wipe his feet as not to leave footprints on the floor. But he staggered a bit. Don't trouble to wipe your feet. I'll wipe it up. It's all in a day's work. Come in, sit down, said Avdich. Here is some tea. Drink it up. And Avdich poured two glasses, and pushed one over to his guest, and poured his own into the saucer and began to blow on it. Stepanich drank his glass, turned it upside down, and set the leftover bit of sugar on it, and began to give thanks. But it was obvious that he wanted some more. Have some more, Avdich said, and he filled the glass again for himself and his guest. Avdich drank his tea, but glanced out onto the street from time to time. Uh, are, are you waiting for someone? his guest asked. Am I waiting for someone? I'm ashamed to say who I'm waiting for. I'm not really expecting anyone, but a certain story is stuck in my heart. I myself don't know if it was a vision or such. You see, my brother, yesterday I was reading the gospel about Christ the Lord, how he suffered, how he walked the earth. You've heard, I guess. I've heard of it, Stepanich replied, but us folk are ignorant and don't know reading and writing. Well, I was reading the part about how he walked the earth. I read, you know, how he came to the Pharisee, but he didn't receive him. Well, so I was reading my brother, and I thought about this very thing yesterday, how he did not receive Christ the Lord properly. Say it happens, for example, to me or to anyone, I thought. I don't even know if I would receive him. But he didn't receive him at all. So I was thinking like that, and I dozed off. I dozed off, my brother, and I heard something call my name. I rose, a voice as though something whispered, Wait, it said, I will come tomorrow. And this happened twice. Well, you would believe this sank deep in my mind. I scolded myself. But even so, I kept waiting for him, the Lord. Stepan had shook his head and didn't say anything but drank up his tea and laid the glass on its side. But Avdich picked it up again 
and filled it up. Drink for your health. You see, I was also waiting while he, the Lord, walked on the earth. He didn't disdain anyone and went about more with common folk. He always went with common people, gathering the disciples mainly from our brothers, sinners like us, and from workers. Whoever raises himself, he says, will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be raised. You, he says, call me Lord, and I, he says, will wash your feet. Whoever wants to be first, he says, will be the servant of everyone, because, he says, blessed are the poor, the humble, the meek, and the merciful. Stepanich forgot his tea. He was an old man and easily moved to tears. He sat and listened, tears rolling down his face. Well, have some more, said Optich. But Stepanich crossed himself, gave thanks, pushed aside his glass, and stood up. Thank you, Martin Optich, he says. You have entertained me and have satisfied both my body and my soul. You're welcome. Drop in another time. I'm glad to have a guest, said Optich. Stepanich left, and Martin poured the last of the tea, drank it, cleared the dishes, and sat down again by the window to work, to stitch the back part of a boot. He sewed, but was constantly glancing out the window. He was waiting for Christ, and was continually thinking about him and his deeds. And Christ's various sayings were constantly in his head. Two soldiers walked by one wearing state-issued boots, the other in his own boots. Then the owner of a neighboring house passed by, in polished galoshes, and a baker with a basket walked by. Everyone walked by, and then a woman in woolen stockings and village-made shoes came alongside the window. She walked past the window and stopped by the wall next to it. Obdich peered at her from the window and saw a woman, a stranger, poorly dressed, and with a baby, stood by the wall with her back to the wind, and was trying to wrap up her baby, but didn't have enough to wrap it in. The woman was wearing summer clothes, and they were shabby. And from behind the window frame, Optich heard the baby was crying, and she tried to hush it, but was not able to do so. Optich stood up, walked out to the door, and onto the stairs, and shouted, My dear, my dear! The woman heard him and turned around. Why are you standing like this out in the cold with the baby? Come into my room. It's better to take him into the warmth, here, in here. The woman was surprised. She saw an old man wearing an apron with glasses on his nose, calling to her. She followed him. They went down the stairs and entered the room. The old man led the woman to the bed. Here, he says. Sit down, my dear, close to the stove. You can warm yourself and nurse your little baby. There is no milk in my breast. I haven't eaten since morning, the woman said but took the little baby to her breast all the same. Obdich shook his head, went over to the table, fetched a cup and some bread, opened the oven door, and poured some cabbage soup into the cup. He took out the pot of kasha, but it was not done cooking yet, so he only poured the cabbage soup and set it on the table. He got some bread, took the towel from the hook, and laid it on the table. Sit down, my dear, he says. Have something to eat, and I'll sit with the baby for a while. I have my own children, you know. I know how to take care of them. The woman crossed herself, sat down at the table, and began to eat, and Avdich sat down on the bed with the baby. Avdich smacked his lips at him, but he smacked them so poorly because he didn't have any teeth. All the time the little baby cried, and Avdich got the idea to pretend to scare him with his finger. He would poke his finger at the baby's mouth and pull it back. He would not put his finger in the baby's mouth because it was all black, dirtied with cobbler's wax. And the baby couldn't take his eyes off the finger and quieted down, and then began to laugh and Avdich was delighted, and the woman ate, told who she was and where she was going. I'm a soldier's wife, she said. Eight months ago they sent my husband far away, and there's been no news. I lived as a cook, and then had a baby. They wouldn't keep me with the baby. For three months now I've been struggling without a place. I spent everything on food. I wanted to be a wet nurse, but they won't take me too thin, they say. Then I went to the merchant's wife. A woman from our village lives there, and they promised to take me. I thought they meant right away, but she told me to come next week, and she lives far away. I'm dead tired, and I've worn him out, the dear heart. Thankfully, 
the landlady pities us, and for Christ's sake, let us stay in the apartment. Otherwise, I don't know what I would do and how to live. Obdich sighed and said, Do you have warm clothes or not? It's a fine time to talk about warm clothes. Yesterday, I pawned my last shawl for twenty kopecks. The woman walked up to the bed and took her baby, and Obdich stood up and walked over to the wall, rummaged for a while, and brought out an old overcoat. Here, he says, it's an old thing. It'll be useful to wrap up in all the same. The woman looked at the overcoat and looked at the old man, took the coat, and burst into tears. Obdich turned away. He crawled under the bed, pulled out a trunk, dug in it for a while, and sat back across the old woman. And the woman said, Christ save you, Grandpa. He sent me evidently to your window. I'd have frozen, my child. When I went out, it was warm, but now it's turned so cold. And he, the Lord, guided you to look out the window and pity poor me. Obdish grinned and said, He did guide me. I wasn't looking out the window without any reason, my dear. And Martin related his dream to the soldier's wife, and how he heard the voice that promised that the Lord would come to him on this day. Everything is possible, the woman said. Stood up, threw on the overcoat, wrapped up the child in it, and began to bow and thank Obdich again. Take this for the sake of Christ, said Obdich, and gave her twenty kopecks to buy back her shawl. The woman crossed herself, and Obdich crossed himself, and led the woman out. The woman left. Obdich ate some cabbage soup, cleaned up, and sat back down to work. He was working, but kept the window in mind. When the window was darkened, he would immediately glance up to see who passed by. Both acquaintances and strangers passed, but there wasn't anyone special. And then Obdich saw, just across from the window... An old market woman had stopped. She was carrying a basket of apples. By this time, there were only a few left. She had evidently sold most of them, and there was a bag of chips across her shoulder. She probably gathered them at a construction site somewhere on her way home. But evidently, the bag pulled at her shoulder. She wanted to move the bag to her other shoulder, and she set it down on the footpath, put the basket of apples on a post, and began to shake down the chips in the bag. And while she shook the bag, an urchin wearing a torn cap appeared out of the blue, grabbed an apple out of the basket, and wanted to slip away. But the old woman noticed, turned around, and caught hold of the lad by his sleeve. The boy cringed. He wanted to escape, but the old woman grabbed him with both hands, knocked off his cap, and seized hold of his hair. The boy screamed, and the old woman cursed. Obdich did not have time to stick his awl in place and threw it on the floor. He rushed out the door and even stumbled on the stairs, dropping his glasses. Obdich ran out onto the street. The old woman was pulling the lad by the hair and scolding him and wanted to take him to the police. The lad was resisting her and denying it. I didn't take anything, he says. What are you beating me for? Let go! Obdich started to separate them. He took the boy by the arm and said, let go of him, Granny. Forgive him, for Christ's sake. I'll pay him back so he won't forget it. Till the stitches wear out, I'll take the rascal to the police. Obdich began to beg the old woman. Let him go, Granny, he says. He won't do it again. Let him go, for Christ's sake. The old woman let go of the boy, and he wanted to run, but Obdich held him back. Ask Granny for forgiveness, he said, and don't do it again. I saw you take it. The little boy began to cry and to ask for forgiveness. Well, okay, and here's an apple for you. And Obdich took out an apple of the basket and gave it to the boy. I will pay for it, Granny, he said to the old woman. You'll spoil them this way, the scamps, said the old woman. You have to pay him back for this so he won't forget it for a week. Oh, Granny, Granny, said Obdich. That's our way, but it's not God's way. If we must whip him for the apple, then what must be done for us in our sins? The old woman fell silent. And Obdich told the old woman the parable about the master who forgave his servant's large debt and how the servant went out and began to strangle his own debtor. 
The old woman listened, and the boy listened as well. God ordered us to forgive, said Abdich, or else he won't forgive us. You must be prepared to forgive everyone, especially a foolish boy. The old woman shook her head and sighed. That may be so, the old woman said, but they already are very spoiled. And so it is for us, the old people, to teach them, said Obdich. That's what I'm saying, said the old woman. I had seven of them myself, and only one daughter is left. And the old woman began to tell where and how she lived with her daughter, and how many grandchildren she had. Now, she says, my strength is little, but I labor for them. I pity my grandchildren. They're good little kids. No one will welcome me like them. Akasuta, well... She won't leave me for anyone. Granny, granny, dear granny, loving granny. And the old woman softened completely. Everyone knows kids will be kids. God be be with them, the old woman stammered to the boy. The old woman was just about to lift the bag onto her shoulders, and the boy jumped up and said, Let me, let me, I'll carry it, granny. It's on my way. The old woman shook her head and heaved the bag on to the boy. And they walked along the street side by side, and the old woman forgot to ask Obdich for money for the apple. Obdich stood, watched all this, and listened as they walked, talking all the way. Obdich led them off, and returned home, found his glasses on the stairs. They weren't broken. Picked up his all, and sat down again to work. He worked for a little while, but soon he could not hit the mark with the thread, and he saw the lamplighter go by to light the lamps. I guess I'll need to light the fire, he thought. He trimmed his little lamp, hung it up, and got back to work. He completely finished one boot, turned it all around, and looked at it. It was good. He gathered together his tools, swept up the scraps, cleared away the bits of thread and awls, took the lamp, put it on the table, and got the gospel down from the shelf. He wanted to open the book at the place where he had marked the day before with the scrap of Morocco, but it opened to another place. And as Avdich opened the gospel, he recalled his dream from the previous day. And just as he remembered it, he suddenly heard something like someone stirring, feet stepping behind him. Avdich looked behind him and saw. It was as though people were standing in the dark corner. People were standing there, but he couldn't make out who they were. And a voice whispered in his ear, Martin, oh Martin, don't you recognize me? Who? Avdich pronounced. Me, the voice said. You see, it is I. And Stepanich stepped out of the dark corner, smiled, and dispersed like a cloud, and was no more. And it is I, said the voice. And the woman with the baby stepped out of the dark corner and smiled, and the baby laughed, and they too disappeared. And it is I, said the voice. The old woman and the boy with the apple appeared. They both smiled and disappeared, too. And Avdich's soul rejoiced. He crossed himself, put on his glasses, and began to read the gospel where it had opened. And at the top of the page he read, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. And he read some more at the bottom of the page. As you did it, To one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And Avnich understood that his dream did not deceive him, that it was as though his Savior had come to him on that day, and just as though he had received him.